Silver and gold had a somewhat volatile week in fiat price action, with both monetary metals rallying in price today to close the week's trading. The silver spot price is threatening a close around 15 fiat US dollars per troy ounce, while the gold spot price looks to be finishing the day above the 1,280 per troy ounce price level in fiat Federal Reserve notes. This week we have an in-depth conversation with a first-time guest of the show. Chris Marcus of Arcadia Economics will be joining us to talk about his decades-long experience in the precious metals markets. As well, we will close our discussion talking about his final interview with the recently deceased former CFTC Commissioner, Bart Chilton. You won't want to miss some of the admissions that Bart Chilton made before passing away from a battle with pancreatic cancer. Be sure to check out this week's show notes for Chris's groundbreaking final discussion with Bart Chilton, covering the silver price manipulation saga, both behind us, ongoing, and ahead. We'll be right back with Chris after this brief message from our show's sponsor. SDBullion.com is a high volume physical gold, silver, and precious metal dealer. Founded in March 2012 with the goal of providing the lowest cost bullion available, SD Bullion has become one of the largest US based precious metal dealers and is regularly recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of America's fastest growing companies. Having now served over 100,000 customers around the world with over 10,000 positive online reviews, SD Bullion continues to gain industry market share by being one of the premier low-cost options for physical precious metal bullion buyers and sellers. At SDBullion.com, you can order your guaranteed physical precious metal bullion products online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Discreet, low-cost delivery is both fast and always fully insured. You can also choose to purchase various qualifying gold and silver IRA products, which can be held in your individual retirement account for long-term wealth preservation. We are committed to being your trusted source for low-cost, highest quality, investment-grade bullion products. Visit sdbullion.com for more information. Welcome to this week's Metals and Markets podcast. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. Today is Friday, May 3rd, 2019, and it's noon Eastern time. With us this week, a new guest, Mr. Chris Marcus of Arcadia Economics. Chris, thanks for coming on the show. Hey there, James. I appreciate you having me on here. I've been following your work for a while. You bring on some great guests and bring out a lot of great information. So, Pleasure to be here and dig into the metals with you. All right. Great, Chris. It's good to finally meet you face to face. We've been you know, interacting over the years just through messages, but it's finally good to speak to you person to person. So thanks for coming on. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, you know, just to get a background on you in case people have never come across your work. Um, you know, what is your background, Chris? Where, where did you how did you end up finding the precious metals markets? Um, if you could give us that to begin. Yeah, well, my wake up call was really when the subprime bubble collapsed. Geez, I guess is uh, some market back to 2008, although I was trading equity options back then on the American Stock Exchange. And really, a lot of the trouble started happening in 2007. Um, interesting now, we still need QE, which 12 years later hasn't worked yet. Let's do more. Um, <clears throat> But I guess worth pointing out, I'm sure if people read the stuff I write or the videos I do, they might think, you know, I have some fetish for gold and silver and, you know, and had bars in my crib, which is not the case. Uh, you know, I just went to a finance undergrad. First job out of school was Moody's bond rating agency that still has U.S. debt with their highest Moody's saying you can't have a higher credit profile. Um, so. You know, then went to a business school at Wharton, which I thought, you know, pay attention. You're going to get the wisdom here. You had Jeremy Siegel t teaching Keynesian economics. So when the things started melting down in 2007 and 2008, 
I was blindsided by it. And I remember as I was wondering when do things get better, it, it hit me. I'm like, wait a second, aren't you kind of the guy who was trained to could have seen this? So it started to just seem odd to me. And I remember Bernanke and Paulson were talking about the perfect storm, how no one could have seen it coming. And it was actually the day, uh, it was in March of 2009. I guess it was the second part of QE1. I remember actually the guy who trained me as a trader, him and this other guy, they were talking about how we we're going to be paying $11 for a loaf of bread. And you know, it was a turning point because, you know, there's that part of us that when we hear something that sounds different than what we're used to, we dismiss it. Although, again, I remember these were two intelligent guys and, you know, I was still out of my Keynesian programming for business school. But when they're explaining, wait a second, this isn't normal that you just pump and print this much money in there. Then uh, a couple of weeks later, he sent me some Peter Schiff videos, and it was for the it was like the first time it all actually made sense. And ever since then, just got hooked on gold and silver, started investing. We can dig into 2011, which was obviously an interesting year, and you know eventually got to the point where I saw something that I thought was really valuable from a trading standpoint saw that everyone that was around me just didn't care. You know, it's it's not that they're not smart enough or intelligent enough, but I mean, it's not what they do. You know, if you go there and you're making markets in some derivative, you're, you're a specialist in that. In many ways, the system isn't really designed to help people see the bigger picture, which, you know, with that said, I thought it was pretty darn relevant, um, especially as you dig into the metals and see, I think most folks who approach it with an open mind find quickly that things are not quite as advertised and in, in how it's set up. Yeah. When you start going down the, the price discovery rabbit hole in various markets, especially precious metals, it's... Uh... It's kind of ass backwards uh, and it's very convoluted and very complex. Uh, but uh, all in all, you start to learn that derivatives really run the show for the most part. Uh, there, there are times where physical does trump it and physical kind of leads the way and the, the marginal buyers on the side kind of dictate where the price goes. But, you know, in the last seven, yeah, eight, eight odd years, that hasn't been the case. Uh, derivatives have been really moving the markets uh, mostly downwards, and but lately a little bit up uh, since I guess or, you know late twenty fifteen. But uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it is an interesting thing. We were talking in the pre interview a little bit about uh, trying to you know what what we do. I suppose is uh, we take we try and take complex things and boil it down so just a simple person can understand it, whether they come on our video out of the blue or uh, they find one of the articles we write this or that uh, and so we try not to talk over people's heads but uh, trying to boil it down to an eighth grade level reading uh, uh, ability that that requires a good bit of skill and uh, I've always fallen short of that I think every time I do any writing it's always you know maybe a, a senior junior level high school uh, hopefully hopefully people get you know the gist of what i'm trying to get across for the well, most part right. I mean, you're a humble guy james although i think you do a great job of that that's what i've enjoyed listening to your interviews and i guess when i was leaving wall street i didn't know quite how it was going to go or where it would end up i knew there was something that i felt you know from that same standpoint that people got blindsided by the mortgage debacle lost a lot of money and it was like how come nobody said anything about that beforehand um and for whatever reason i often used to wonder why was it that i was able to see this and the guy next to me wasn't um so i felt some sort of responsibility to at least speak up about what i was seeing I remember when i first got to, got into trading you know, and you hear the stories about things that go on. And I always wondered how I would respond if I was sitting there one day and, you know, my boss says, do this. And it's something that was illegal or unethical. And um, fortunately, I never had that direct situation. But I, it's, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> you remember the Occupy Wall Street from uh, a couple of years back? Mm -hmm. I would actually walk through that on the way by the, on the New York Stock Exchange going through that back and forth to work every day. 
And I guess what maybe stood out, there was one day I was walking home. There was one guy with a sign saying a job is a right. And he was standing next to a guy wearing a Ron Paul t-shirt. It was like, that was where it was so clear that you have people who have been ripped off. And I think it's fair to say that by a system that is much different than what we've been told and how it was advertised. So it's like people are angry, yet they don't even know who did it. I mean, because it is so complex. And as I thought of what it was that I could really offer, uh, I mean, I love listening to interviews about silver and, you know, all this stuff that goes on and wanted to in some way put it in context so that, you know, my mom could understand it or, you know, just regular people because when it's explained clearly it's something people can get i've run into a lot of people who say they were afraid to ask more because they thought they would look like they're stupid and the big short really did a great job of pointing that out you know where wear expensive suits they call things clos cdos you know mortgage back synthetic you know, and in the end, you know, you can translate the printing money to give out to a lot of stuff that isn't a good investment. Um, and it's continued on. So really trying to put it into perspective for people in a way that they can get it, like you said. And again, I find that mortgage example really a relevant point for precious metals folks, because you were saying in 2004, 2005, mortgages were a bubble. There was, there was a problem building. You weren't wrong. You're just early. And similarly, I, I get the frustration people have with the last seven years. Um, it, you know, I've, I've sat there and eaten the pain and lived with it too. Yet with that said, you know, look at the way it worked out for those folks in the movie. They had to eat a little stress for a while. It wasn't, even when the market was, the, the fundamentals were saying, yes, your trade was right. Similar to how I would say a lot of people saw QE1, saw QE2, bought metal, and fundamentally they were right. Realized later on, all right, the game's a little bit rigged. But I think the, the good part is that when we learn to let go of the frustration and accept the world and things the, the way that they are. I mean, you can structure your trades so that, you know, again, I'm not saying this if the economy is melting down that you want at someone else's expense, but when you understand what's going on, I mean, it is perhaps the financial opportunity of a lifetime for the people who are prepared for it. Right. I mean, it's, I guess it's also a matter of perspective because, you know, when we had that little run up from 2009 to 2011 in gold and silver, uh, you know, it brings on uh, a quite a different and varied crowd. Uh, some people talking about gold and silver going up forever and this hype train kind of gets built. And then, uh, you know, as the prices go down, it's like you got to buy now because it's going to go. It's going to fly. Um, and so it, basically it's uh, it's one of those things where I think people who got in at that time had a time horizon that was not, um, it basically was not conservative enough. And, uh, and they, after that, they have to look for someone to blame. Uh, and so a lot of that blame gets put all over the internet. And so, you know, a lot of people get called out and this and that, and that goes on even to this day. Uh, I don't think people understand for physical precious metals, it's a long-term type thing. Uh, you want to put a prudent amount of your allocation, um, you know, in your investment portfolio into them and set it and forget it. And hopefully the other uh, assets that you own, you know, perform well. And if they don't, hopefully the bullion, you know, does its job. Uh, the other thing to remember too, is if you're buying gold, uh, you're literally shorting the entire system. I mean, basically gold is the call on uh, the system not working. Uh, so, you know, when gold rises, you know, very high, when it goes up on like a, a chart like this, that means the system's in, in question. And uh, I still believe that's coming. I still think that that's uh, in our future and po possibly in the decade to come. So, you know, it's basically just getting in this with the right time, with the right mindset, I, I say. I mean, that, I think that's the key. Yeah, and especially uh, interesting, you mentioned, James, the, the spike that we saw in 2011, 
Similar, uh, maybe not as extreme as the the spike we saw on cryptos about a year or so ago, which uh, I think both of those people look and say, is this a bubble? Although I would point out it's the exact inverse of the dollar supply chart or the debt chart, where, I mean, look at those that are spiking. So, you know, for folks, maybe you're just hearing some of this for the first time. If you have a hundred dollars, you know, you have a simple economy. Hundred dollars, hundred apples. You know, so if that's the only good, you know, each apple is going to be worth a dollar. Mm -hmm. Some central banker shows up on the island, prints another hundred bucks the next day. You know, if that's still the, you know, you're going to have the prices adjust. Similar to which, I don't think people really. I think people realized that there was money printed. I think people realized something was a little different. Yet I'd say even within the metals community, I don't think people often grasp the extent of how much was printed. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind the Fed's uh, balance sheet was about slightly under $900 billion in uh, August, September of 2008. Went up, uh, I guess it was over $4 trillion. Um, it was funny. I've still not heard really anyone else mention this. I, I just happened to be watching one of Powell's Senate appearances about a year and a half ago. And one of the congressmen says to him, uh, you've mentioned before that in terms of normalization, you're going to bring the balance sheet back to two and a half to three trillion over the next three to four years. Powell just looks at him and is like, yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? What? When? We had $800 billion before the crisis. Bernanke told us for years how it was transitory, temporary, headwinds, all these other <laughs> buzzwords they get from CIA school or whatever they come up with these things. And now here, normalization is now 25 to $3 trillion, which to me, said, well, that's the $2 trillion QE package that nobody announced. Top of it, he said over three to four years, which means it's not going to happen. And sure enough, it did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no, it, I mean, it, it, just just you're talking about late December is a, is a freakout show uh, as far as the stock market's concerned. You know, before this interview yesterday, I did a I use this tool a lot. Uh, anyone out there can can find it. It's called Google Trends, and I did a Google Trends search for the the search of Dow D O W. And that's what any, you know, monkey with a phone on, you know, in their pocket can can enter into their phone search just quickly to see what's going on in the stock market. So it's a good read and tell on, you know, what the interest is and whether or not people have a lot of emotion. Uh, and so I looked at it and the Dow Google Trend search was the highest it's ever been in December of 2018, higher than even uh, the fall of 2008. And that's po possibly because people are more connected now, but it still was a freakout show. And what Mnuchin did on Christmas Eve was, uh, you know, that was the tell. It's like it's obvious that they're they're going to in intervene the whole way to prop up the pensions, to prop up the system that they painted themselves the corner uh, with. And so expect more interventions, more often, more explicit, more obvious. And, and that's coming. And that, that's already happened just a few months ago. And that's coming ahead. So I just get used to it. Yeah, I mean, so somebody explained to me who's buying the bonds. Yeah. No, it's like accounting gimmick. I just I believe that a lot of the accounting gimmicks that are going on and a lot of the off balance sheet stuff. I, I think there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that we're not being told. Yeah, I know there are a lot of folks who uh, can speak to it at a more qualified level than myself, but I do believe whether it's the Exchange Stabilization Fund or some version of that that has some other name that we haven't even heard of. But, you know, the public data, which take that as you will, shows that China's not buying more. Some say they're selling small. I think Japan was a small seller. Obviously, Russia. And I find the Russia thing interesting, where they dumped all their treasuries, yet people act as if it's, you know, some small island, you know, with a five person population and some, you know, they're, they're a major commodity <laughs> exporter. I mean, a major one. And and people don't take that into, into consideration. They always are like they belittle it and say, oh, it's got the GDP of Texas. And it's like, well, they, they do move a lot of oil, a lot of gas, 
a lot of real real world goods and they they're, they're doing it more long in the east and someday you know in the future we could end up with a system where you know the western half of the world has their own monetary system and the east has their own and it just springs up out of you know it's starting slowly but surely you know china as far as the oil trade is now what 13 percent of it uh with their uh, shanghai contract so it's happening slowly but surely but it could speed up you know with people belittling it the whole way yeah that's that's the thing that i would say to folks who you know are feeling frustrated about the metals pricing where again i get that and i understand it although similar like where the signs of the mortgages were there. I mean, we're not talking about, well, maybe one day China will do this or Russia will do that. I mean, I sit here stunned by the day. I see these news headlines, all right, uh, I guess a couple weeks or months ago, Russia was talking to OPEC about some new arrangement. We've had the uh, petrol yuan in effect for a year. I don't know what came of it, but I remember uh, China actually had a meeting with some of the African countries to discuss using the yuan as the reserve currency. I mean, these are things that didn't used to happen. It's just glossed over like, all right, but Facebook's up 10% today. And, um, you know, the way you see countries say things overtly that you know, I know there's a school of thought, which I think probably has a fair amount of truth to it, that Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein, yeah, maybe partly about the oil, but once they started talking about trading things outside of dollars, you know, uh, was, uh, John Perkins' Confessions of an Economic Hitman goes into detail about a lot of that stuff. So, you know, to see by the day, you know, Iran... Venezuela would be a point right now. I mean, literally... The Monroe Doctrine is something where the U.S. can say, hey, Russia, China, this is our backyard. This is going to be our oil. Literally, we're going to we're going to spring this coup and we're going to bring in our capital and we're going to set up the infrastructure for this oil and you can get the hell out of here. And so I, I think that's what's happening, essentially. Uh, I mean, it seems like that's what's happening now down in Venezuela, yeah. where again, I'm. I, I, I at least am smart enough to know that everything I've probably heard about Maduro, and I'm not saying he's a nicer guy than any of these other guys, but comes from the American media. And when out of left field, we're deciding who the president is, why is the United States deciding who's the president of Venezuela? And, you know, especially shortly after Venezuela asked for their gold back in a transaction that does not involve the United States, and yet U.S. sanctions, we've seen eerily similar. Did you ever happen to see that film about the Magnitsky Act? No. Interesting documentary, uh, which has a lot of similar signs, which essentially gave the U.S., the ability to pass a law that they can freeze assets of foreign terrorists, mm -hmm. which, you know, if you have someone honest deciding who's the terrorist or not, maybe is okay. When the U.S. government's deciding who the terrorist is or not, I find it gets into a little gray area. And then here now that's that, that sanction was used to prevent transaction that did not involve the U.S., and again, I'm not trying to say Maduro or Guaido is the good or bad guy. I don't have the first clue. Yet, in the very least, let's say you're Iran and you had gold stored in the Central Bank of England. Would you feel comfortable with it there? Yeah, yeah. And the best was the Central Bank of England when they were asked you know, by Venezuela for their gold. They came back and said, we're not going to give it to you because Maduro is going to spend it. <laughs> That's a good excuse. <laughs> and I, I mean, mean it's, uh, it's literally people asking for their gold back. I think shortly uh, after the Venezuela thing, was it uh, Turkey or Romania wanted yeah. to repatriate? Yeah, and they turned and said, "Well, you got to get the EU to sign off on that." So good luck, essentially. Yeah, and if if I may uh, comment on this situation for one second, because I know people mention it, but. It's so stunning when you take a, set, a second to really think about we have a Federal Reserve and a Fort Knox supposedly holding this gold 
yet refuses an audit, which, James, you work for a, a metal shop. You know, would you feel comfortable or would your customers feel comfortable if they're like, well, we have your gold, but for no, we're not even going to provide a reason why we can't audit it, but we're just not going to tell you. And it's funny, uh, funny, scary, disturbing. Um, I'm guessing you know Koos Janssen uh, over in the Netherlands. Actually, uh, got a chance to meet him a couple of years back. I saw he had an article that shows the Treasury has lost seven out of the 12 audits that have been done on Fort Knox. Yeah, yeah. Which, <laughs> yeah. So with uh, Dr. Mark Skidmore, who goes in and says, hey, you know, I, I, excuse me if my numbers are off. I think he said the one year the the Department of Defense had a budget. It was $122 billion, and there's a transfer on the books for $700 billion. And he says, hey, uh, it's a little unusual. What's going on with that? Sure. They take the documents down. They say, I don't know. What company would have that situation? And the first thing they wouldn't be doing is getting lawyers and accountants where it's just, so that's why uh, it becomes harder for me as the days and months and years go by to see this as, you know, oh, well, Bumpkin Joe, Senator, just, oops, we didn't, you know, we were drinking too much whiskey that day. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think there's a lot of folks that know very clearly what they're doing. Maybe to put that in perspective, I think there's enough evidence and documentation that not only were there not weapons of mass destruction, but they knew there were not weapons of mass destruction. Right. So that same mindset, whatever you want to call it, that you see in, it was interesting. I started because I was in finance. I was able to see it in finance first. Yet as people, as I started to see the footprints, I would notice in all these other areas that same type of pattern, which I think on the positive side is becoming exposed, maybe not as quickly as people would like. And I can't pretend to imagine a thing. I mean, uh, geez, even the, we could sit here and talk for days and then we'd still only know a tip of 1% of what's actually going on out there yet. <clears throat> and we can dig into uh, what I talked with Bart about. But I think there's a degree to which we're not talking about, you know, you know, I like chocolate ice cream, you don't like it. I mean, it's not like a political preference, but it's more, to me, there's a series of crimes that have been committed, some of which are manipulation of markets that, you know, at least on the positive side, keep in mind that unless J.P. Morgan or the banks uh, figure out how to alchemize gold and silver, you know, in that book that I've been doing, where I wanted to put this into perspective for folks, so if they knew nothing about silver, whatever they choose to do, at least grasp what's going on that David Morgan, Craig Hemke, Bill Murphy, Keith Neumeier, a whole bunch of folks. Uh, I asked a bunch of them, am I missing something? Or do you agree that these numbers I hear that for the leverage is about 500 to one, where for every ounce of silver, there's 500 possibly, uh, David Morgan said, if you add in derivatives, it gets even bigger. So 500 or more people who think they own that. And I guess if uh, somebody wanted to know why did I walk away from a career in trading? Uh, I mean, that that was it, where it was like this was the most stunning, misbalanced market. It's set up, in my opinion, for the short squeeze of a lifetime. And... I've spent the last decade trying to see if I'm missing something or if there's some, although, you know, now I've been sitting here talking to anyone I can find in silver and they, everyone says the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even Jeff Christian's out there talking about, uh, you know, new nominal <laughs> highs for gold of 2022, uh, given some recession coming up and, you know, silver threatening 50 around that time. So even, uh, what some would deem a, an apologist of the system, he's out there uh, 
talking a absolutely bullishly about what's going to happen with precious metals in the coming years. So, uh, you know, from the far spectrum of uh, the apologist all the way up to the to the pumper that some, you know, might might claim some people are. Uh, I think there's people who are who are, you know, uh, I would say uh, pretty confident that this coming decade will be good for the precious metals. Now, I wanted to ask you, you know, since you've been in this for so long, what are some of the biggest lessons or, or perhaps some of the mistakes that you've made along the way? Huh. Well, <clears throat> I would say the biggest lesson uh, is that whether it's trading, whether you're playing football or politics or anything that we're doing in life, and I know especially for the silver crowd, you know, we can be a somewhat bipolar bunch and, you know, because especially I think when you see what could be and really how, to me, silver and gold represent, you know, these ideals that we were sold of freedom and a, and a prosperous economy where people can trade. So I think people get very passionate about it and it's almost like, and, and I'm not saying this to uh, judge anyone else. This is about, I've experienced it too. You know, take it personally when the, the things go down or, you know, we get frustrated about the manipulation. Although I, I find it's helpful. Again, we all want to make money. We all want to do well and take care of our families. And I think when you're studying this stuff and you have an open mind, that naturally falls into place. But just... I think the mindset is that important and maybe an example would be you could have some guy who knows all the numbers, you know, is the smartest guy out there. But if he thinks, oh, no matter what I do, I'm fucked, I'm, uh, I'm going to lose or I'm going to get smoked, that'll impact your trading. And maybe you'll know what's going to happen, but when it's time to make a trade, you know you should do, you're talking yourself out of it versus, I mean, I would say you could have the guy who's a complete moron and knows nothing but really – believes, you know, somehow I'll get this, you know, and especially I never imagined I would find some of the things I've come across and certainly, you know, not as much my area of specialty, but I do agree with a lot of the folks out there that a lot of people we've trusted are doing some very disturbing things that are really affecting people which can be hard to take, you know, and you see people being injured and, well, you know, uh, I think a lot about, I mean, geez, we printed away 99% of the dollars somewhere around there since the Fed came along. And I imagine every single parent out there is working two or three jobs, feeling stressed, tired all the time just to take care of their family. And it's like, geez, if they even got 10% instead of 1% and the banks cut back to 90%, you know, imagine everybody woke up tomorrow and had an extra zero on their salary. Mm, sure, yeah. Do you, you think we'd have as many people going out, beating the heck out of each other or stealing or... <laughs> so, I mean, I get it where there is a lot of emotion, but... As I've learned more about how to handle that, I think this, you know, when we react with anger, I, I think these guys love that. Yeah. That feeds in. I mean, look at this Democrats, Republicans. I mean, tell me a difference in the policies between Obama and Bush. Right. Bush doubles the... We started in 1776. <laughs> 225 years later, we're at $5 trillion. Mm -hmm. He doubles it to 10. Obama doubles it to 20. I mean, now it's, it's not even like well, talks well, about. I mean, I just saw an interview last night. Now we're, now we're moving into the MMT phase and discussions of, well, we can just write that off. Like Japan, you know, there's been discussions in high finance circles that Japan can, you know, they own, I guess, roughly half of their own debt. And at some point they can just say, uh, you know, that that stuff, it's gone. Magic. It's gone. And that, that's possibly something that could move forward here. That's that's the argument about deficits don't matter, where at some point the United States could just literally wash its hands and say, hey, you know, all those treasuries, we own X amount and it's not valid any longer. So so that we're getting into voodoo economic times where there's going to be a lot of things that we never thought possible. We've already seen it right with NERP 
and other things and QEs, et cetera. But uh, there's more coming is what I'm telling you. All the guys I've been talking with, whether the book or otherwise, I find, I don't think there's anyone who imagined back in 2011 that eight years later we'd have $15 silver. No, no one I don't, did. No one did. No one did. I mean, who would who could have guessed that we'd be that there would have been something called quantitative easing? Right. So it's like a lot of these things are unprecedented, but maybe something that hopefully could be helpful to folks is that you know, again, when I got into this, I felt really comfortable, more comfortable with anything I'd ever done in my trading career with gold and silver because, you know, the debt is what it is. I mean, if someone can explain to me how it's not past the point of no return, I'm trying to find where I might be missing something. No one has told me that yet. Um, and especially you have Trump in there now who has a lot of bankruptcy experience, which is interesting to think about because either there's, I don't, I mean, maybe you can, <laughs> Either I only see that there is an explicit default where eventually they say the money's not there, which is what happens to any other entity that's bankrupt. Mm -hmm. At some point, the money's not there. You declare bankruptcy, you restructure, you do something. Right. Or, which might be well more likely that they'll just print it, an implicit default. Um, but in either case, you know, we saw, like you mentioned, last uh, September, October. I mean, rates, we only got to two and a half percent and the thing was melting down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you hyperinflate, good for gold and silver. If you try and do what conceivably would be the responsible, honest thing, I think the system's so far past the point of no return. I mean, we only got to two and a half percent. And to put that in perspective, following Greenspan lowering rates to one percent for a year back in 2003, I think his final hike was in 2006. I believe he brought the Fed rate up to five and a quarter. We only made it to two and a half. Yeah. Yeah. And still have four trillion on the balance sheet. So, I mean, I think they know. Well, a good, a good, a good thought project sometimes is to imagine yourself in Jerome Powell's shoes, right? Yeah. Just literally get very empathetic about it and pretend that you're Jerome Powell and that you have good intentions and that you want this to work out the best for the most. Uh, so what does that require? Uh, that probably requires propping up the stock market and eventually letting commodities melt up and the U.S. dollar devalue pretty strongly versus goods. I would imagine that in a, in a partial default in, in other ways. Uh, so it's a mix of both. How about Jerome Powell or someone out of the Fed or someone out of the government is actually honest yeah. and explains what you and I <laughs> and the other guests that you have on your show? Yeah, it's not. That's that's not the American way. The American way is to talk in flowerly language and do things underneath that are the reality, and that's the problem a lot with uh, with with us just in general in our society is uh, is this. Uh, dream that we live in and and underneath it it's really a nightmare in some ways and i and i i uh, you're you're right it's not what they do i don't think it's an accident um which is why i'm baffled uh i don't even know what the right word is perplexed with the whole trump thing where coming into office i I keep looking it up. I'm like, maybe I just imagined that, but then I'll look up, see him talking about stock market being, I think he called it a big fat bubble, said audit the Fed, yeah. was talking about a gold standard. And then now, I mean, it's like by the month, it gets almost more ridiculous. First it was the Fed shouldn't be raising rates. Then last week, now he wants a 1% rate cut. And, and look again how you get the media's focusing on wow, look at this. He's questioning the independence of the central bank. Put the central bank in the White House, put it on Pluto. Does it matter? They're, they're doing the, the, the same thing. And uh, I would also point out for anyone who's uh, hung up on the independence of the central bank, um, I read Paul Volcker's autobiography uh, a couple months ago, 
where he talks about how there was a meeting with uh, Reagan, and I believe it was was it James Baker. Mm-hmm. I, I apparently Reagan didn't say anything, and I think it was James Baker basically came and said, "Don't raise rates until after the election." So. Yeah, it's political for sure, no doubt. And, and all Trump needs is a bad recession. And he's out of here. I mean, that's essentially why he's he's beating the drum so hard about, uh, you know, we need stock prices to be high because I need to get reelected, essentially. And that's what I read out of it. Yeah, I hear there are a lot of folks out there who suggest that he's actually knows things that you and I are talking about, is aware of the gold and silver situation and that, He's playing some sophisticated game of chess in the sense that perhaps maybe the only way to truly end this matrix of power that we've been living under where governments, banks, is there really that clear of a boundary at this point? Um, So I maybe I'm hoping for that more than thinking it could be the case, although... It is baffling where, again, just such, you know, and maybe he's just like every other politician in the end and says one thing coming in and then one thing that he does. But um, certainly fascinating to imagine what's going on behind the scenes. We hear about these arrest warrants, indictments. Um, Yeah, I think that's hope. I think that's just pure hope. And uh, my hunch is, you know, whether or not he gets reelected, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hear a different tune. Um, people will turn back if he doesn't get reelected and say, you see, it was all because of that investigation they were running. He wasn't able to go after people and put them in prison. That'll be one excuse. B, if he gets reelected, then they'll just keep talking. Yeah, indictments are coming, indictments are coming, and, and my hunch is they won't. Uh, so I, I wouldn't get my hope up for criminal prosecution across the board and tribunals and all these types of things. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic that we're going to see anything like that. I can certainly understand that, and uh, it's it'll be fascinating as stuff comes out over the years and uh, next couple decades. I mean, who? I can't even imagine what's going on behind the scenes that we don't see. Mm-hmm. Again, just reacting to the things that I'm presented with publicly, where here's your largest creditor, you're calling them a currency manipulator, starting trade wars, doing everything possible to antagonize them and i know a lot of folks uh and i'm not saying that china's first choice is to go out and dump their treasuries but you know it's like how far are you going to push it and i pray that never comes to this but if the u.s says all right you know we're stepping up into military escalation Everything this government does is funded by printed and borrowed money. So, well, yeah, maybe they'll take a loss on that chunk of treasuries. I mean, I don't... (laughs) Sure seems like they're buying a lot of gold, which is a darn good hedge. And at least to the degree that they have leverage where it's like, you know, either cool it or, you know, if you're really going to put a gun to my head, yeah, I do have something I can do. Mm -hmm. Um... So it's it's hard. Uh, that that's why I was lend some credence to maybe Trump's doing something different than what he's saying because what he's said publicly is just so contradictory and baffling that it's just, it's just hard to to reconcile. Yeah. Well, I want to swing this over to uh, uh, a big point of this interview. I, I I was really happy to see that you got to uh, recently interview Bart Chilton, especially now that he just passed away. Um, if you don't mind, listeners out there, giving them a background on who Bart Chilton is uh, to begin and maybe how that interview came about. Sure. And uh, just quickly, I'd uh, like to send my prayers and wishes to his family and everyone who knew him. Uh, I did not know him well although I have a lot of respect for him and admire what he did. Uh, Bart Chilton is a former commissioner of the CFTC, which uh, is like the SEC of the metals markets, probably as effective as the SEC. Um, And in many ways, the silver thing reminds me of how Harry Markopoulos was sending the SEC information years in advance, warning about Bernie Madoff, to which they just ignored 
Um, but Bart was kind of the one exception from the CFTC uh, where, you know, he was really sharing some of the information. He did interviews where he acknowledged he thought there was inappropriate behavior going on. I know there were some people who were critical of Bart saying he should have done more or he was on this side or that side. Again, I can only go by my own personal experience. Um, I did email him in 2011. Must have been after one of Ted Butler's columns where he used to say, you know, send this to your congressmen or senators. Um, because I think the first thing that really made me start realizing something was not right in this market was September of 2011. I was actually uh, I was going to visit Rick Rule in San Diego the next day. It was that holiday weekend. I remember being in a hotel room. This was after the U.S. had gotten downgraded and everyone was saying this was Frank last safe haven. Get this Wall Street Journal alert, middle of the night saying they're going to peg to the euro, essentially removing that haven. And I'm like, oh, geez, this is, gold's probably going to bust through 2000 bucks yet. Gets pounded in the middle of the night when liquidity is thinnest. And my reaction is the same now as it was then, that if I had executed a trade like that for the shop I was working in, they would have thrown me out the same day. Mm -hmm. So that led me to start reading about Ted, and I did contact uh, the five commissioners, uh, I think also the two congressmen, I was in New Jersey back then, saying, look, you know, I'm working on a trading floor, I'm sitting here studying this, you know, I'm pretty sure something, <laughs> pretty sure if I did this on my trading post the next day, you'd have me in jail, so, you know, I grew up, my parents taught me to be an honest person and, you know, stand up. And again, I'm living through this mortgage debacle where people are pissed off because no one said anything. So I'm speaking up about what I'm seeing. Bart, uh, as he mentioned in some of his interviews, uh, I think in the interview I did with him mentioned how he responded unless someone was, you know, being rude Call, about calling him a rat. Yeah, that's what he said. That's funny. And he wrote back and he said, you know, I understand what you're saying. You can reference some of the interviews I've done on this, which was talking about different. Uh, I think there was one on King World News and, uh, you know, other stuff where he said, I believe there is manipulation. And it was interesting. I always remember the last thing he wrote was something like, but it takes three out of five votes to pass something. Yeah. Which my interpretation was he was saying as much as he could I'm doing what I can, but yeah. interpret that as you will. The other, the other guys in the room turned off their inboxes. Like you literally couldn't even email them. Stunning how he mentioned that in the interview I did with him where it was like, you know, they just didn't want to hear it, which good, good test to let the anger go. <laughs> hey, Chris, I, I just, just, I mean, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I even called uh, about a month or two ago. I tried calling the SEC, CFTC, and Department of Justice. They made it clear. You were like, get off the phone, buddy. You got you know, Tetris to go back to or whatever. <laughs> but just the idea that, and they have, I've never met James McDonald, the guy who's the CFTC commissioner now, but I don't know if you caught any of those podcasts he did. Hard to listen to. We're saying whistleblower program, speak up. Mm -hmm. If you see something wrong, or, or no, we're counting on the banks to turn themselves in. And a big thing to me was, if you're really doing a legitimate investigation, why was Andrew McGuire uninvited from that CFTC meeting? And if you really don't have the evidence, well, God bless Ted that he sits there every week and does all the legwork for you. But it, it just, when you refuse... So I can't I can't answer those questions other than manipulation that Ted answers, mm -hmm. and and I would like to point out that Bart, as well as John Edmonds, I think a lot of us believe Ted was correct in something very similar. Now there's no shadow of a doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's been confirmed. So, you know, again, I always appreciated that Bart said that back then. I followed uh, through the years, and again. You know, was uh, 
wanted to do a book where just you know all the you know guys who really get this and what's going on and can add something uh so it was uh there was actually at anarcha poco down in mexico this year it was was thinking about the uh, book and then Bart's name popped into my mind. At first, I didn't think that I was like, eh, maybe I'll ask him. He probably won't do it. Um, then, uh, you know, like, even if he does, like, will he be able to talk? Um, and I was surprised. I just contacted him, uh, I think, through the show site. Really kind uh, and just also in, encouraging and I guess one thing I, I've heard a couple people comment on is whether they felt he had a burden to get off his chest or what his motivation. I know some folks have suggested he knew he was close to passing away and that's why he said what he did then, which is possible. Although I guess uh, one thing I'd like to, uh, and appreciate you letting me share here I'm not sure I agree with that. It's possible, although the thing is, he didn't contact me. And it wasn't like I had contacted him for months and then I left field, he said he would do it. It was, uh, I think March 21st was the day we actually recorded it. It was like a week before that, I asked him, I'm like, hey, uh, would you be interested? And he said, sure. Um, I wrote up a list of questions. I don't think he actually even saw them before he got on and I was like, hey, are those questions okay? He's like, I, I think he said he didn't check it, but anything you want to ask is fine. He said before the interview, during the interview, and after the interview, something to the effect of, you know, I really appreciate, he didn't say to me, he's like, I really appreciate you're getting this stuff out here because it's important it be heard. I mean, I'm, I don't know, I always feel grateful someone makes time to come talk about it and but I felt that it was not, I didn't sense any that he felt guilty. I think he felt proud that he did what he could and felt there was a lot of information that needed to be out there. I don't know this for sure, although my guess is, I wonder if anybody ever else asked him to do an interview like that. Yeah, yeah, he'd probably not. Probably and not. He, Again, uh, you know, there's a lot of smart folks of which you're one and there's other folks in the metals industry, uh, you know, but just saying in the sense where, you know, it's like you and I, we've both been digging into this for 10 years. So maybe to ask, to know which questions to ask, maybe not everyone has the same perspective. But again, as I was thinking in my thought process, even like, you know, when I first thought I'll interview him, oh, he won't want to do it or, you know. So I'm guessing maybe other people had similar, or yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, but um, so to that degree, uh, I, I I couldn't say for sure, except the impression that I got was I found him to be a really kind, honest, genuine man who believed in what he was doing and felt it was important for that to be on the record. He even had uh, offered, he's like, hey, when your book's finished, come on to my show and we'll discuss it. So that was my take. Um, and certainly then once we started the interview, I was wondering if certain things he would have to hold back on or whether he'd be able to fully discuss. I was surprised at some of the things he told me. I guess the biggest shock to me was when he said that basically we had this standard of what defines manipulation. They did the investigation. Later on, he had this, the standard change so that had that same investigation been done now under the new rules, that there would have been a conviction in his opinion. Um, <clears throat> I think another thing that I'm grateful, especially for Ted, who's really, I think we all owe a lot to Ted in a sense, because I was always careful about saying JP Morgan did this or that because, hey, you know, there's what I can prove or what I believe or, but, you know, Ted found the stuff, put his name to it for years. You know, and certainly, you know, bank that has God knows what legal resources. Yeah. But I was really happy for folks like him and Bill Murphy and Gata that, 
you know, uh, mainstream folks and, you know, uh, did not like the way Jeff Christian handled that debate um, with Bill Murphy several years ago. I'll just leave it at that. But now here it is. All right. You know, you can say they're wearing a tinfoil hat looking for aliens, but here's the evidence. So now who's the conspiracy theorist and Bart? It was interesting. He starts saying, I would never say that a certain bank had 40 percent of the market. And then he kind of just said, he's like, but you can look at the reports. And J.P. Morgan took over that position from Bear Stearns. He said the position was so big that it was over the limits. They gave him a temporary waiver to get out of it. And what did they do? They put it on even bigger. You know, so now I think for folks like us and the other folks who have been doing this, uh, I mean, certainly, you know, a lot of a lot of these things unfortunate in their own right. But to the degree that. You know, we're not guessing anymore. It's not my opinion or your opinion. Yeah, the U.S. Department of Justice is prosecuting uh, currently. Yeah, and one note on that, I did speak with a reporter yesterday from one of the mainstream financial media, which left me really encouraged. uh, Two notes about it. One is that her interpretation was that the, I guess there was a three-month delay and then it turned into a six-month delay. Again, I'm going on her interpretation. I'm not a legal analyst, but she thought that that meant that basically John Edmonds is cooperating and before he's sentenced to you know, give out information to get some of the bigger guys. It's funny, I asked Ted uh, Butler, we did an interview with him for the book last week, I was saying between what you've written, John Edmonds, now what Bart Chilton has confirmed, is there any confusion for the Department of Justice, especially when you have, I mean, you or I, you know, we can say whatever we want. We can't go subpoena someone or get the trading records. But if you can look on who was on the sides of these trades. So I guess the other takeaway from that conversation with the reporter was that and I'm going to be careful to how I phrase this. I'm not saying, you know, Silver's going to whatever tomorrow, though. Basically, as we do this interview, it looks like Silver is actually up for a change, which is nice. <laughs> but after talking with her for an hour, seeing her level of interest, and I know sometimes mainstream folks get blocked and who knows what happens, but... Also, you know, just the way uh, a lot of folks have contacted me about the Bart Chilton interview. And I think from the standpoint that truth speaks for itself, you know, again, I don't claim that I get everything right, although my intention is to find the truth, not I don't think that, you know, the silver story is the biggest, in my opinion. I don't I don't know of anything in currently that I've seen or in history that matches the magnitude of about what's to happen. And I don't say that because I'm doing a book about it. I'm doing a book about it because that's how I've felt for a decade. And I think it's kind of hard at some point to squeeze the genie back in the bottle and seeing the things, especially now that you do have that confirmation from Bart, that you do have this case ongoing you know, it's one of those things where eventually as people find out about it, you know, someone, in my opinion, is eventually going to squeeze this market because, you know, someone, the metal's not there. Right. I mean, we're, we're getting to the point now, uh, maybe next decade, where this becomes common knowledge. If silver all of a sudden goes back to the price where I think it would be without all this intervention... You know, it'd probably be around 75 bucks right now, something like that. You know, commodity prices would be much higher than they are. Uh, all commodities have been suppressed in this uh, last seven years of uh, central bank action. And you can just go down the COMEX rabbit hole and learn that foreign central banks are allowed to trade derivatives in virtually everything and are incentivized to do so. But uh, that aside, the point of it is, is that uh, eventually common knowledge will come, you know, as the commodity melt up maybe happens and people will turn and be like, yeah, so silver was manipulated for a decade and that's why the price is going crazy. So what? 
<laughs> I mean, that's literally where it, where it goes at some point where it becomes common knowledge. And we're still talking in the recesses and the weird, weird corners of the Internet. But at some point, you know, that book that you're writing may end up becoming something that uh, explains it in a in a detailed way. I'm really moving to finish. Uh, I think I've done 11 or 12 interviews and kind of as it's built, I've been stunned as I go along where it's on one hand, a lot of stuff you and I have heard, but just hearing these different, you know, folks, uh, you know, from different areas of the globe, uh, Ned Naylor, Leyland, uh, gave, uh, you know, fund manager perspective, Bill Murphy gives the GATA perspective, Chris Powell, Ted, Bart, I mean, I, I think they lay out some stunning information and I don't know if the Department of Justice, what they will or won't do or what J.P. Morgan or if they're holding the medal for whether J.P. Morgan is theirs or they're holding it for someone else. Someone has a lot of metal. Mm -hmm. So. But the thing is, is that maybe here's a situation where greed will work out in people's favor because I keep thinking, you know, you had John Paulson, large hedge fund manager, you know, invested in gold a lot. Mm -hmm. From my experience on Wall Street, I don't think it's that these guys can't get it, but it's just something that no one looks at. And as you dig into all the time, you know, I, there's a fair effort to keep people from looking at it or Oh, what's, why would you want silver, this or that, versus it's actually funny. I was trying to find someone for the book who would give the the opposite case of, you know, no, Chris, you're wrong. Silver is going to go down below. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's the long-term bear out there calling for nine? You know, maybe, you know, that's perhaps some bears may say. Sure. I mean, but it's like there's not, I don't know what the case against it is. Uh, maybe and, maybe a U.S. dollar melt up would be the case someone could make, you know, where where all of a sudden we go into a strong dollar situation or like mid 80s. Possibly someone could argue that. Which. I mean, I and I factor in, yes, if someone wants to say that before all this happens, <laughs> we'll get a massive rally in dollars and treasuries. I think that's very possible because sure. just to the degree that this massive Pavlovian experiment where people are trained to think a certain way. I think anything is possible in the short term. If silver went down even lower from here, it would be stunning yet. But I don't see, uh, you know, it's like Bernie Madoff's scheme was going to end when it did. You know, maybe the guy was nice one day or had great jokes or whatever, but it's no different. And, um, you know, uh, so I guess I, I guess maybe in the medium and long term, the downside is very limited, uh, whereas the upside is pretty high uh, in the silver market is what you're seeing. Yeah, well, there's there's a lot of skew to it where I get it when Pete you know, thing goes down, you know, from 16 to 15 bucks and people are like, oh, well, maybe I can get silver for 14, which, yeah, you can. And again, it all depends on how someone sees it. I guess the simplest way I've thought of it is that. You know, if silver hit 50 bucks after they were launching QE2, so clear reason for the move up. We can go Google the transcripts, even from that night of these guys giggling and bragging about smoking the price down. So, you know, just a simple way, if they hadn't manipulated it, especially U.S. The U.S. was getting downgraded, all this stuff happening. I thought it's at least somewhere north of there. How far north will be fascinating to find out in the coming years. But um, I think it's a great time to refine our uh, patience. All these different folks I've interviewed, even about silver outside, you know, they they talk about, hey, the way I've made the most money in my career is when I buy things that are cheap. You know what you're doing. And I, and again, I appreciate all the things you do, James, in bringing information, which sometimes maybe it's just repetitions where you hear something enough and you think about it until you're able to say, all right, yeah, they're going to manipulate it fine. But the best thing about the physical metal, you know, I stay away from most of the paper stuff. 
Um, I do some mining shares and option trading. Maybe someday we can dig into, uh, I'll tell you what, if there's a move coming in the metals, not being priced into the option market, mm -hmm. but obviously that's a much different investment and a different risk class. But for most folks, if you buy an ounce of silver, an ounce of gold, tomorrow it's going to be the same ounce of silver or gold if you leave it there. So structuring your trades, maybe my other lesson, as you asked before, when I left Wall Street, I had about $250,000 saved because I was leaving. I didn't have another place to go. Although actually I didn't have $250,000 saved. I had that equivalent in physical bullion, mining shares, or options. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that to recommend to anyone else going 100%, which, <laughs> you know, at times has been painful. Although I say it just in the sense that after working for what I felt was a particularly smart trading shop, you know, where from a trading standpoint, similar to poker, you're not always looking for the home run when the singles are there, you take it. Yet, just my overall impression between trading background and what I was seeing you know, again, like you were saying with the skew before, yeah, it could go down. Maybe somehow it goes down to 10 bucks. I don't think that's going to happen. But to me, you know, am I going to try and get another dollar there versus just, you know, if you don't lever yourself, don't necessarily do what I did. But, hey, if you have an extra 200 bucks or $500 every month that, you know, you can still pay your expenses and you leave it there. I think it. I don't. I can't find anything else that I would rather have if I had children. That if I had to leave something that I couldn't touch for 30 years. Yeah. Um, personally, I don't think it will take 30 years. Uh, I think it's on borrowed time, and certainly be fascinating to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris, I really want to uh, thank you on behalf of our listeners uh, for coming on, and uh, I do hope that when you get that book done, you you. Uh, you know, be nice enough to come along and, and, and show us the book and tell us about the book and all your findings along the way. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Uh, again, it's great to finally catch up with you. I really do appreciate what you do. And I know it's not the easiest path in life, but you've you've made a difference for me. In fact, for I was reading, uh, interviewing Ted, I was reviewing your interview with him, which you do some great stuff. I think... Uh, Maybe I didn't realize this in the beginning. I think it's bigger than just finance because I think we're going along and seeing there's things, uh, you know, that are happening where I feel grateful and honored to be a part of and, uh, you know, certainly unfortunate about Bart passing, although I, I feel uh, blessed that I was able to speak with him and, um really kind man so again thanks for having me on here it's been really fun catching up with you yeah chris thanks so much